Welcome this morning to our first official breakout session of the Service Learning Colloquium at the University of Montana. I'm pleased to have you all come today. We have a great slate of, um, of sessions for you, and uh, we're kicking it off with our panel of faculty members and community partners that we work with here at the University of Montana uh, for service learning and outreach projects. So I want to take just a minute to do a very brief introduction of each of the panelists. They can go into more detail as they're talking. Um, I will pose questions for the panelists, and we'll sort of take turns, I guess, talking in pairs, uh, responding to the questions. And we'll have a chance as well for audience questions uh, throughout uh, the session. Uh, my name is Andrea Vernon. I am the director of the Office for Civic Engagement here on campus, and so I have the uh, wonderful job of working with faculty and students here on campus, as well as various nonprofit partners that we work with here in the community um, through the school systems, uh, the government, county and city government, as well as nonprofits. Um, so it's great to be able to have the panel come and talk firsthand about what this experience is like for them. Because we can talk about service learning and civic engagement, and these are sometimes very abstract, sort of lofty. Uh, words that we throw around. And I think the panel today and the sessions hopefully uh, throughout the rest of the day will help to really sort of bring it down to a realistic, practical working level to see how this works day to day in the classroom and in the community. So I'll take a minute here, like I said, to introduce the panelists and then we'll get going on our questions. So I'll start here with Annie Sondag. Annie is a professor in the Health and Human Performance Department here on campus and she's sitting next to her program partner, Lisa Biskevich, who is a supervisor with the Missoula Flagship Program. Next we have Josh Slotnick. Josh is a professor here in Environmental Studies, and he's sitting next to Jason Mandela, the Community Education Director at Garden City Harvest. I hope I pronounced your last name correctly. Okay. Uh, next we have Alicia Crandall. Alicia is the coordinator of the Foster Grandparent and Senior Companion Programs at Missoula Aging Services. And she's ne sitting next to her faculty partner, Gail Hudgens, who is a professor here in the pharmacy practice uh, department on campus. So welcome. Thank you to our distinguished panelists for taking your time today. We really appreciate um, your time and your, your expertise in this area. So with the first question, I just would like you to introduce yourselves uh, a little bit more, um, talk about the service learning class specifically that you're involved in with your partnership, um, and the target area in the community. What, what's the specific issue that you're trying to address through this service learning project? So Annie and Lisa? Again, my name is Annie Sundag, and I um, teach in the Health and Human Performance Department. And the particular class that I utilize uh, service learning in is a class called Foundations of Health Education Health Promotion. And it's sort of a community health education class. And what we do in that class is we try to develop programs um, based on a logic model, based on a, pro a very defined process of how to develop programs with goals and objectives and look at our target audience. And so partnering with a community agency is a perfect way um, to have students not only learn the material, but actually be able to apply it um, in the community. So it's, it's been a really good experience for us. Do you want to? Add anything to that, Lisa. And so I'm Lisa with the flagship program, and the flagship program is an after school prevention program, and we're based in 11 Missoula County Public Schools. And our program is free to all students at that school. So we um, highly are highly are dependent on having volunteers come and work for our program. And so what's great about our partnership is that she has students that are interested in working with the education, the um, the education field of students and so coming out to the schools and applying their health related topics and working in the after school setting which is at risk hours between three and six so they aren't engaged in risky behaviors so we're increasing increasing protective factors and decreasing the risk factors in youth and having her students coming out to lead those activities and to work with those kids and everything from outdoor recreation opportunities to first aid training to Gladiators, I, it's, you just name it, we do it. So it's pretty fun. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, my name's Josh Slotnick, and I teach in the Environmental Studies program. And uh, m most of my job in Environmental Studies is working at the Pease Farm up on Duncan Drive. I teach students who 
are learning and working simultaneously at the Peace Farm. It in itself is a service learning entity. But I'm here to here with Jason to talk about a, a, a twist on that. Um, a few years back, probably six or seven years ago now, we started getting elementary school teachers calling, wanting to know if they could bring kids up for field trips. And uh, I would stop what I was doing and run over and talk to them and then go back to the university students and then run, go, run over and go back to them. And, and uh, you know, I'm kind of a schizophrenic guy anyway, but this was a little much. Uh, out of that, uh, we recognized an opportunity that there was an opportunity for university students to be practicing environmental education and an opportunity for uh, elementary school students to be experiencing environmental education, but it required more than what I could do. So we look to our community partner in the creation of the farm, Garden City Harvest, to start a community education program. And Jason can tell you how that's working. Uh, so I'm Jason Mandela, and uh, I'm the community education director for Garden City Harvest. And um, how that works is we have a very high demand nowadays. We have about 2,000 kids come up to the farm. Um, now, we don't always have opportunities for service learning um, per se, but what we do have in the fall is a practicum class, which allows students to sign up through the Environmental Studies Department, and I essentially teach them how to um, lead children around the peace farm and practice lessons with them, um, which is often challenging, but, um, and then they have the opportunity to do that for about six weeks in the fall, and that covers about 800 students that they get to deal with. And so they get on hands um, learning, um, actually getting to teach younger kids. Um, and they also get to learn about sustainable agriculture. So um, it's kind of a nice combo class. Um, and there's a work element too. Um, and we also do occasionally do independent studies with students to help us develop our, our, our curriculum needs as well. Hi, um, I'm Gail Hudgens from Pharmacy Practice, and I'm actually involved with service learning in three different courses that I teach, two of which are required in the uh, pharmacy curriculum of all the pharmacy students going through our program. Uh, the one that we're talking about here today is one that we offer in uh, the very first semester, the very first pharmacy practice course our students take when they enter the program, uh, Pharmacy 309, which is an uh, introduction to pharmacy practice. And in that, um, throughout that semester, we match our brand new students one-on-one -on -one with a senior in the community that they will be um, expected to get to know uh, during that first semester through usually a series of at least three visits. Um, our goal with this program is, is twofold, and one is to introduce and have our students uh, develop and maintain a relationship with an older individual in the community uh, throughout their uh, six semesters that they're on campus in the pharmacy program. Uh, too often, our students' primary exposure, as it is for most healthcare professionals, uh, to the older population is to the frail, elderly individual in the hospital or the nursing home who is certainly not a good example of what many and most of our seniors um, are doing today. And so we came up with this idea, of course not the most original, because other schools around the country are doing it, including medical schools, but of pairing them with a senior. They actually stay with the senior, as I mentioned, over the whole three years and have activities in each year, uh, each semester, uh, where they go back and, and interview and interact with this individual. Um, faced with finding 65 seniors every fall to pair with these students, um, I fell back on Missoula Aging Services. Uh, my area of interest in pharmacy is geriatrics, and I had been on the Senior Service Corps Advisory Council, I think that's the right name, uh, for quite a few years, and through that become acquainted with the staff of Missoula Aging Services. And uh, while Alicia is relatively new to her position there, uh, we um, worked with Missoula Aging Services to recruit foster grandparents and senior companions to participate, and they provide about half of the seniors that I use every fall uh, in the program. And I'll let Alicia talk a little bit about what the seniors get out of that, because that might be a question in your mind. <laughs> 
Hi, I'm Alicia. I work at Missoula Aging Services. I'm a volunteer coordinator with the Foster Grandparent and Senior Companion Program. Foster grandparents are people age 60 and older in the community that are income eligible, so they're living on fixed incomes, that agree to do 20 hours a week of service in the schools assisting a teacher in exchange for a small stipend. And the senior companions are doing same kind of requirements, income eligible. They're doing 20 hours of service in the community matched with usually a social worker and they have clients, someone they see Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, every week. And those programs are both part of the Corporation for National and Community Service. A lot of people don't know that Senior Corps is a sister program to AmeriCorps and Vista. Um, there's about 80 people in Missoula, 80 older adults involved in the program. And part of our goal with the program is to also offer them diverse opportunities out in the community to do service. So this was just a natural relationship. It, it went over very well. And I, I think one of the main things it's addressing is just the topic of ageism. And I mean that both ways. Um, university students, as you said, might, might think of Missoula Aging Services and think nursing home or frail, frail elderly. Um, and vice versa that a lot of our volunteers think of college students uh, and have stereotypes about them too. So it really busts open those boxes, those stereotypes and ad addresses that issue. All right, with our next question then, if you could talk specifically about how the partnership developed between, you know, who sort of prompted the contact? Was it the community coming to the campus or the campus searching out opportunities in the community? How long has that partnership been in place? Um, and just the way that it, it works sort of at the ground level, the lo logistics of working out that partnership. So, Annie. Oh, there it is. All right, well, Lisa and I were talking about this. I've been doing service learning for so long that I'm having a hard time remembering how this all came about. Um, but I think originally, every semester, I, like many other people, were searching for community agencies that would be willing to take on two or three students and have them help plan a program, and that's not always an easy thing to do, as many of you probably know. And Lisa was coming into classrooms recruiting students for the flagship program, and it suddenly occurred to me, she would email me and say, can I come to your class, as you did to many classes. And um, it occurred to me that, wow, the flagship program might be not just a volunteer opportunity for my students, but a perfect uh, service learning opportunity for them if they could actually design programs to deliver to the after school uh, program. So um, I, got, I think originally we broached that idea with one another, and then I think Andrea informed me about a service learning grant that would be uh, possible to help fund the students um, in their work. And so I got involved in that a long time ago. I can't remember exactly when, five or six years ago. So we now have a small grant, and students have money that they can spend on their um, flagship students, which is really exciting. Sometimes they'll buy them soccer balls or UM water bottles or those kinds of things to keep them motivated and interested. So that's kind of how the whole thing, um, the whole process came about. I still utilize other community agencies in that class. One of the things that I wanted to make sure was that students weren't forced mm -hmm. to work with children if they really didn't want to. So flagship is always one of um, the options that I give them along with two or three other community agencies that are willing to work with students. And we usually have a good percentage of students who choose to work with flagship. Mm -hmm. I really think you just covered everything in a nutshell. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that was beautiful. That was good. So I'll just pass it on. So in my little intro, I, I described a bit about the, the anecdotal history of how this started. I can fill in some details here. Um, I, I can't remember six, seven years ago. It was somewhere in there uh, when I was experiencing this kind of tension uh, between really needing to do two tasks at once, tend to the uh, elementary school students and teachers who are coming to visit the Peace Farm and continually to uh, tend to the university students. I saw there an opportunity uh, for a graduate student. We had some graduate students in EVST who were interested in, in, in environmental education, and one of them 
took this on and thought that she could create a curriculum and, and engage the elementary school teachers in a, in a greater way and did that. And that, that kind of got us started. It was apparent at that point that this thing was bigger than one graduate student. And that's when we looked to, uh, to Garden City Harvest. And Jason really took that and made it a much bigger thing. And where I see the service element here is that the university students are providing a service to the elementary school students and to the elementary school teachers and learning how to be environmental educators at the same time. So it's a, a great model of service learning where their education is really wrapped in to the work they're doing. So here you go. Um, I don't have much to add as far as history goes, but um, another element of service that I always think of is that the students are serving Garden City Harvest in a way. Um, not that I couldn't do all those field trips, but um, they do help out a lot with curriculum. Um, they each have to do a lesson plan, um, usually in pairs, but that could, that, those developed lesson plans become a part of our curriculum after they're uh, polished up a little bit. So that's a nice service to have. Um, and another thing they always, that is nice to offer, since I only, I'm the only person that's um, in this program as, as a part of Garden City Harvest, so um, I don't get a lot of other viewpoints so it's nice to have students in that can offer up different vantage points and talk about things that they felt were effective that maybe I miss um, along the way. I, again, going back in memory, I think I became interested in service learning around the year 2000 or so when the Montana Campus Compact had some funding for fellows and I was able to get a small grant and also very able, lucky and able to attend a national training session for health professional faculty involved in service learning that's held in um, Leavenworth, Washington every year. And out of that came home with lots of ideas, um, one of which was this idea of matching our, our first year students with a senior in the community. So I think it was 2002 that we got started. And as I already mentioned, I had a relationship already established with Missoula Aging Services and turned to them along with um, any number of other folks in the um, community. I'm shameless. I recruit from my Kiwanis Club that I belong to. I recruit from former neighbors, uh, retired faculty, just about anybody that fits the age demographic uh, in, that I interact with and think would make a good senior uh, ends up uh, with a request to participate. <laughs> You covered it. I'm going to pass it. <laughs> OK, well, with this next question, maybe we'll have the community partners answer them first, because we want to give equal <laughs> air time here. Um, so for the community partners, it's important for us to know about the type of impact that students are having at your organizations, at the organization level, which Jason sort of alluded to earlier, uh, but also in terms of the impacts on the beneficiaries of the service. Uh, what does that look like at your organization, and um, and how has it either helped you in your programming efforts to do more as an agency, or how has it steered you in other directions? I would say with uh, the partnership with the HHP department, what's really helped is that the flagship program is at capacity, and so we serve about 4,000 students a year, and that's a lot of students to be serving after school, and so the more students that we have working with the youth, um, two to three per class, and you know class sizes of 10 to 15 students, we're able to provide more opportunities for those youth at the schools. So it opens up the doors for more after school opportunities for them, as well as a unique opportunity of having um, a student that has a high interest in the HHP field. So somebody that's able to teach them good sportsmanship and um, you know soccer skills and how to, um, I'm just so impressed. One year we had a first aid uh, student at Hawthorne Elementary School that did a first aid training with fifth grade students, so how they take care of their buddies when, uh, when they got hurt. So it's just really impressive at how broad the HHP range can be and how we, uh, the students really um, fall in nicely with our logic models of what I mentioned earlier, increasing the protective factors and decreasing those risk factors. And we really work, the coordinators at the schools really work with the, the students on realizing those impacts and what prevention is and um, knowing that their outcomes are lifelong um, experiences for those students. And that, you know, and it's what's amazing to me is that when the students come out to the schools, 
we always are like, you, you know, you need to be on time, you can't be late, you can't miss a, you know, um, a flagship activity, and we really emphasize, emphasize that reliability. And if they are, it, the students are more apt to be upset with them than the coordinators are because they develop that bond so quickly and so powerful, and that's been an interesting thing for me to see, is not only are they teaching a skill, they're building relationships with these students. And so no child can have too many positive adults in their lives, and you never know what impact you know, that person walking through that door will have on that youth. So it's been a really a successful, powerful experience, and as well as I think having that hands-on service learning opportunity really emphasizes to that student, yes, I do want to work with that student population, or no, I don't. And so I think it's really important for the student co component that Annie provides to know that that's really what they want to do for the years to come and, you know, the jobs that they want to seek, so. Sounds so good. <laughs> <clears throat> um, I kind of spoke to this a little bit in the last um, question, but one of the other things that, um, the students that come work, work with us provide is um, they give us an opportunity to work with more of Missoula's youth. Um, since I'm only one person, I can only take on about 20, 25, maybe 30 kids at once at the farm for a field trip, um, which is a little overwhelming. And, and they don't get the most attention that um, I would like to give them. So when we have students come up, they always get to work in pairs or even threes, which gives us the opportunity to split it up into smaller groups. Um, we can have 60 kids come up at once. Um, and as far as the schools go, that makes it easier for them to bus the kids there. Um, we provide busing for them, but we, and this is a benefit for the organization too, we'd rather have that busing bus up 60 kids at once instead of 20. Um, so when we have students there from the university working with us, um, we can have four or five people even leading these students around. They get more attention. Um, they're getting multiple viewpoints from all these people that are involved. And uh, it just gives us a better opportunity to serve these kids and have a more well-rounded program. And I, I believe the question was, how does it impact our volunteers or our agency? I interviewed about 10 of our participants in the service learning project. And I asked each of them, what do you receive? What do you receive from this experience? And I tell you, each and every one of them would tell a story and say, whoever I was matched with, Joe, he listened to me. Or he asked me a lot of questions about myself. I got to tell him about things I haven't thought about in years. And it was, it was almost as if they were talking about a grandchild. And I, I guess that's important just to feel needed. And to also, um, I, I heard Lisa say it, no child can have um, too many positive adult role models in your life. I think that's true for us too at whatever age we are, that we need role models too. And when we give the older generation in our community an opportunity to be role models and uh, tell their stories, it's, it's, it's fabulous. Um, I also think it's a great opportunity. Uh, the volunteers can educate the students on the fact that a lot of them are living on really fixed incomes. Half, some of them are living at or below even half of what the poverty level here is in Montana and that they're making it and that they're still doing service. And um, I also think that they're educating, uh, the volunteers are educating the students about, I know a lot of them talked about they have to jump through a lot of financial loopholes just to get energy assistance, to get housing, sometimes to put food on the table. And a lot of them are on medications. So to talk to a pharmacy student that is getting that fresh new perspective on things, um, they can give them advice or encourage them to talk to their doctor about things. It's just a very win-win situation. So, yeah. All right, if you want to keep it down there, Gail can start with the next question for our faculty. Um, if the faculty members can describe how they integrate the service uh, to meet the learning objectives of their course, what are the mechanics of that like? And also, what kind of assessment do you use in your class, and what type of reflection activities do you use in class? 
Okay, well, my situation's probably a little bit different from most faculty using service learning, at least for this particular course, because um, this course, uh, of course, we're trying to expose the, the students again to the older population, and this course, as I already mentioned, is an introduction to pharmacy practice, so we're covering many different topics, nothing at very much depth, and um, what I'm really using this uh, experience for is just an introduction to a whole uh, realm of information that the students are going to get through their three years on the campus. We don't teach a specific course in geriatrics nor one in pediatrics uh, for pharmacy students, but we integrate that information throughout the entire curriculum. So I end up going into many different classes and teaching different topics on older individuals uh, throughout the pharmacy curriculum. Um, similarly, as I already mentioned, we're having the students go back to their senior part your partner each semester for um, another assignment, usually an interview, an interaction of some sort uh, that the particular faculty person has incorporated into their course. Um, so as I said, it's a bit atypical because I don't have the ability to accomplish the entire interaction in one semester. It's actually going out over three years. Uh, but we do reflection, and in terms of reflection, um, we have, the way our program is structured, um, every student is in a small group, usually eight to 10 student conference um, each week. And those are uh, correlated with certain courses, but I have the ability to go into those conference groups and uh, visit with them during the semester, which I try to do twice, to find out how they're doing with their senior partnership and what kinds of things are they discovering, what have they learned, have they encountered any problems, and we kind of try to problem solve any difficulties they're having, if they're having any with contact or communication or whatever it might be. Uh, at the end of the semester, they write um, a short paper on their experience in which they have to address um, a summary of what they learned uh, about their senior because they are, as um, Alicia has kind of pointed out, doing somewhat of a life review in their interactions with the senior during the semester. Um, I also have them address uh, what they have learned about the older population that will help them later on in their pharmacy practice. Um, also what they've learned on a personal level that may you know, help them in relationships with, with older individuals. And since most of the individuals involved, all, most of the seniors are involved in community service, um, they also address you know, what they've learned about community service and again their future involvement in that area. Our program is a little bit different in that the experience the students, the university students have uh, leading elementary school students around the Pease Farm in doing practical environmental education isn't part of an existing course. It became its whole own course. When we saw this uh, as a, an opportunity, we realized it was big enough to stand on its own. And the course functions much more like an internship than it, uh, the, our program functions more like an internship than it does like a course with a service learning uh, component and uh, so I worked closely with Jason and he set up assessment tools and works closely with the students and then he and I interact so he can tell you about the assessment part of it um, basically um, what happens in this course is these students come up learn how to teach these kids about sustainable agriculture very quickly in two weeks and they're obviously experts by the end of that two weeks um, and then they get to do it, and, and they do it every day, pretty much, um, in some way or another, um, for about five weeks. And uh, <clears throat> the course ends in late October, early November. So it's a fast course, but it's only two credits. Um, but the way that we assess it is I'm working with these kids pretty much every day during that time. So I go out, watch them, work with them, teach with them. Um, and then kind of hide behind the greenhouse and watch them when they do stuff. Um, and then as far as the written stuff that they'd have to do, they also do a lesson plan, like, like I said earlier, um, develop their own lesson plan for us to use in the future to fill in a gap in our curriculum. Um, and then I'll take a look at that, and every time it's always been something really good. Um, and then they do reflection papers as well. Um, I make them keep a journal. Um, I force them to do it. A lot of them don't like doing it. 
Um, but then at the end, they have something to use for this um, reflection paper that they turn into us, which is really helpful to us. Um, it's helpful to them, I think, too. Um, but it also helps me develop the program, look for where there are gaps and stuff like that. Um, and then finally, we're switching over this year. It's always been a pass-fail course. Um, so this year, we're switching over to a graded course, um, which will be interesting. And there's going to be a little bit more elements of assessment now um, to deal with. Uh, and Josh will have to help out more with that. Come in. <laughs> So as I'm thinking about answering this question, I'm thinking that it's going to be difficult to answer this question without talking about some of my challenges. Um, so you might get to skip me on the next round. Um, the course that I teach is kind of a core course for our students in applied health sciences. Program development is one of the skills that we really hope they have by the time they leave. That's one of the skills they can market when they're looking for jobs. And so. For me, the service learning project is really an integral part of the class, but the content is also really important. And so I break the class, the program planning part of the class into three parts. And you know, it's never a smooth road. I can't say like other people that it's, um, that, that it smoothly fits into the course. It's always, I'm always trying to cram it in. Um, they start out with having to look at their target population and do quite a thorough review of the literature on the characteristics of that population. I try to get them to do some interviews with people who work with that population. Initially, I tried to get them to survey the kids until Lisa said, Annie, stop that. <laughs> like, you cannot survey our kids anymore. Um, for good reason, good reason. But So I'm always trying to, they have this, this upfront work that they have to do, um, which is quite extensive in terms of describing their population and researching the health issue that they're going to be helping with and then and then setting up goals and objectives for the program. So I always have this struggle between they're not just volunteers, um, which I think most agencies just want them to come in and do their volunteer thing, but no, they have all this, this month or six weeks of upfront work to do and then they have to develop their own specific goals and objectives for a health-related program. And oftentimes, you know, you're kind of trying to get those to fit with what the goals already are of the agency you're working with. And certainly flagship has a ton of programs um, that are already established. Um, so my job is to get my kids to really look at those programs and say, what, what really are the goals and objectives? And I always want them to have educational goals and objectives because I'm a health educator. So I don't want them to just go in and play gladiator games or I don't want them to teach soccer skills. I mean, they're going to do that, but I'm always having to say, OK, now we have some educational goals here. Let's write a lesson plan or a program plan that relates to these educational goals. And so there's always that little push-pull there trying to um, fit it all in and trying to, to work with the agency when they really need someone to play soccer. And I really need kids to do some education. And I think we've, over the years, we've, I've, I've given in, OK, they can teach soccer. I used to say, no, I don't want you just teaching soccer, but I'm requiring that you do ten, five or 10 minutes of education with those kids. And I don't care how you do it. You can play a game. You can you know, integrate it into something dealing with soccer. But you have to have an educational component. And so that's been, that's been interesting. And I also think oftentimes, because I'm in the Health and Human Performance Department, it's assumed that we just do activity. And Lisa and I have kind of talked about that over the years as well. And um, in applied health science, we're really program planners. And we cover all aspects of health, mental, emotional, spiritual. And so I am always have that push-pull, too. I, don't, I want my kids to branch out into, they've done some self-esteem programs, some sportsmanship stuff, um, looking at some bullying. We have some kids this, this semester who are going to work on bullying and how to teach kids not to bully and to deal with bullying. So I'm always trying to also push them away from, let's not just go out and play a game. Let's make that game into something that's educational. So that's been um, interesting and, and, and worthwhile. But it's not always been a smooth road, I don't think. Yeah, I think that's a great segue into the next set of questions then. <laughs> so thank you. Because working you know, in this bridge zone between the campus and the community and trying to um, have that be a perfect marriage is, is challenging. And there's, with those challenges come successes. So if you all want to take an opportunity now to sort of talk about what have been the aha, the success moments, and what have been those areas that have presented the most challenges for these partnerships. Community partners. 
Okay, I mentioned some of the successes earlier in being able to open the doors to provide more programs for our youth and with um, volunteers, student volunteers that are interested in working with that population. Um, I think another success is that Annie came up with a one sheet summary of what's expected of her HHP students that we can share with our coordinators. So we're bridging that gap of, yes, this is what the university students need out of this partnership. So I think that was a really helpful tool when we figured that out in like year three or four. <laughs> like, so, um, so that was really successful. And um, I just, I think it's just been a really successful partnership overall. And I, and I think what makes it su successful too is that Annie and I communicate a lot. So we'll communicate via email or phone, you know, if something comes up or we have a question, we just really, we don't let it bubble, we just communicate immediately and, and deal with that. So I think communication between the community partner and the professor is really important. And, um, and do you want me to talk about challenges sure. at the same time? Okay. Yeah. So the, I say that, you know, some of the challenges are, is it finding students that can work during after school hours? So, you know, you have students that want to come and, you know, participate and do their service learning project with flagship, but we really focus on that three to five hour um, at risk hour. So trying to, to balance everybody's schedules out and, and every semester we say, this is going to be the hardest part, matching students with their interest of not only the day of the week that they're available, but the population that they want to work with, whether it's elementary students, middle school students, or high school students. So it seems like once we, we cross that bridge, then um, then we're on the fast track. So, but I don't think we have that many challenges. I would just add to that. I do have some copies of of the service learning proposal I send to coordinators and uh, some of the assessment instruments I use because that's also a challenge when you have three students working on a project, writing papers um, that are being assessed. Um, just giving them a grade is one of the challenges that I face in terms of kind of trying to differentiate who did what and who really showed up and who didn't show up mm -hmm. and who actually did the work. So I've, I've developed some very rough instruments if people just want to take a look at those. And, and I just thought of one more success is that um, having a service learning grant opportunity to apply for some funds to support the service learning grant, uh, service learning project for the students has been really helpful. So. Um, to be able to send a soccer ball home with a, a child that doesn't have a soccer ball is huge. I mean, their eyes just light up and they're like, wow. So, because we work with a lot of uh, low-income families, and I would say probably half of the population that comes to Flagship are probably on free and reduced lunch, if not more than that. So, and Flagship is open to all students, but I really feel like we really engage the students that are kind of on the crack, you know, they aren't involved in every activity, but they might not necessarily be in, you know, major trouble. So I feel like we, um, working with that population, we really give them the bump up to um, being positive, healthy adults. And what success with that partnership would be that her students helps flagship reach, reach our mission and our goals. So, so I think reaching each other's missions and goals of our programs is huge and just communicating that, so. So <clears throat> listening to these guys, two successes uh, jumped into my mind. The first one uh, really specifically has to do with the environmental studies program here at the U of M. We say that we offer opportunities in environmental education, but uh, they're thin, unfortunately. We have one faculty member, Fletcher Brown, who works in education as well as EVST, and he does a great job. But the opportunities to do environmental ed, not just to learn about it, are relatively thin. So. The success is, well, we have one now, <laughs> and, and that's really good. The other, the other success, is, I think, comes out of communication, and that the place where I work most of the time is at the farm, the Peace Farm, the same place where Jason is teaching university students how to do environmental ed. So we can communicate informally, really regularly, and out of that, when it comes time to make changes to the farm, which happens all the time, we can incorporate each other's needs into those changes so one doesn't roll over the other in the best scenario they kind of weave into each other. And I think that would be really difficult if we weren't on the same site and didn't have intimate knowledge of that site. So the regular informal communication uh, has led to success. And I'm gonna let you talk about challenges. Well, I, I wanna mention a couple more successes. <laughs> um, I've already mentioned a lot of them, um, I think, but uh, the other one for me that's been kind of the aha moment was um, 
that this is most effective when done um, in teams, uh, teaching these kids. Um, I can do it by myself pretty well, I think, I hope. Uh, but when you have two people doing it, um, leading a group of youngsters around an outdoor area, um, it's kind of hard to corral kids and, and have them, you know, pay attention the whole time. So having it in teams in the fall is really, really effective um, and I think really helps these kids um, learn much more about sustainable agriculture, which is our goal, and put that little seed in their head and uh, hopefully they'll, you know, eat better and want to be gardeners in the future and stuff like that. Um, as far as challenges go, um, I'll go straight to the grades. I'm really interested to see how that's going to work out next year um, because it is hard to to assess students that do this um, especially when they come in and I only have them till um, November and then I lose them and uh, and they have other classes to do so and this is a pretty big commitment from September through the end of October um, and I need them up there at least three days a week um, usually more and that's a big commitment for a college student they have other classes these are usually graduate students and upper level students because it's a 400 level class so um, they want to make it a priority I know they do in their heart but it's hard especially when it's a pass fail class so that's kind of why we're shifting to the grades um, another thing is a lot of these kids don't have experience teaching firsthand um, so it's hard to prepare them in about two weeks to take this on um, and do it for five straight weeks when it's really affecting the way uh, these kids are going to be looking at sustainable agriculture in the future. So that's a, definitely a challenge, but the university system is, you know, doesn't match up with our growing season very well. Uh, so we just deal with those kind of challenges. Thanks, Jason. There are so many successes in the partnership we have for uh, the intergenerational service learning. One would definitely be for both individuals, it increases their social supports in the community. And we all know that that's great for self-esteem and their overall health. I'd like to give a few examples, too, of stereotypes. I talked a little bit about the ageism and stereotypes. Um, we have one grandma over, foster grandmother over at Lewis and Clark named Mary. And I know her student came into her classroom and spent the day with her to see what she does. She, she uh, speaks Spanish, Japanese, and sign language. And guess what? She's teaching it to her kindergarten class. Um, Mary also teaches yoga at the senior center. And she is a water baby over at uh, the Women's Club, which is a group of women that perform and swim together. Very, very active. We also have another uh, senior companion who uh, just recently got a car, but when it gets warm out, he's known to bike about 25 miles a week on his bike. That's how he goes to see his senior companions. You might see him down reserve, biking away. So it really breaks open those stereotypes that our older community, they are very active, and they're just people. We're all just people and vice versa with, col with a college student that are, um, a lot of our volunteers may have some really negative stereotypes about, about young people and it builds trust. And I think that's great for them to have trust in the next generation. I also noticed, and I talked to one of our other uh, volunteer coordinators who works specifically with volunteers under the age of 55, but I think this, when we get more college students become um, enlightened about what Missoula Aging Services does, we get more younger volunteers coming in to help out. And we have seen that that volunteer pool has grown since we've started this project. So. Uh, that's that's a very positive thing as well. Yeah. In terms of um, successes, uh, my I know great relief is felt every semester when we get that 65th volunteer corralled, and we know we're going to have enough to match everybody up. But um, 
one thing I didn't mention earlier that I guess is uh, falls somewhat in the area of assessment. Um, I do have the students complete a little short little pretest uh, questionnaire prior to the start of this experience, and then they complete another one at the end of the experience. It's very brief, uh, with uh, I think about eight questions that deal with their uh, attitudes toward the senior population as well as their attitudes toward community service and then there's some open-ended questions um, on each of these and we've um, collected this data and analyzed it over the years and while we don't always see a significant change in attitude over the semester while they're engaged in this experience probably the one thing that has been consistent is they're always amazed at how active and how busy um, the older population is, I, you know, blows um, away their uh, idea of the retirees sitting at home watching television and, you know, not really out in the community doing uh, anything. So I think that's been a success to get them that exposure. And then they also leave that semester with a senior that they uh, can engage with in the subsequent um, activities that they'll be doing throughout the, the curriculum. Um, Challenges, um, probably other than recruiting enough seniors, uh, and again, it, it speaks to the busyness of uh, not only the students, but also of the seniors that are involved in the project, um, is probably just getting the connection made. Um, you know, I warn the students that they um, you know, aren't going to just get the senior on the first phone call. It may take a number of phone calls to actually connect with this individual because they each have each other's phone numbers and that's how they, they establish communication. Uh, and then we do run into situations that just never gel for whatever reason. I always have a little backup list or I like to have a backup list of seniors that I can call on if that initial um, pairing doesn't work and we have to fall back on um, a, another person to step in and, and uh, pair with that student for the rest of the semester. But luckily that's a fairly minor part of the uh, thing that develops. Well, thank you for those responses. I think a common theme that I heard from especially the success stories was that element of reciprocity, which is so critical for effective service learning. There's obviously needs on the side of the community as well as on the side of the campus. And those most effective partnerships really have strong sense, uh, strong elements of that reciprocity where there's give and take in the partnership. And I just wanted to highlight that because it is so critical for effective service learning programs and courses. With that, we've got about 10 minutes, so I want to be able to open it up. So maybe through the Q&A, we can sort of give the, the elements of advice that you would give, which is the last question that I wanted to pose. But I want to be sure to have time for questions. So uh, let's go ahead and open it up to the audience for some questions. Yes. I am um, trying to figure out how to sort of bridge the gap between a university level classroom experience and high school experience. So I'm the faculty advisor for the Mali United Nations conference that happens every year. And um, we didn't realize until recently that teachers who bring all their students don't often know really what's going on. Uh, and so we need some lesson plans. And I have no idea how to build a high school lesson plan. So I'm curious that most of you are talking about having lesson plans uh, that, you know, that you create lessons for the high school students. So I'm wondering what tips you have, what you, how you do that. Where are you found a way to do that? Okay, I'm going to restate the question for the purposes of the television because they don't have the, you don't have the mic out there. So if I paraphrase your question, um, if that's okay. Uh, the question was, how do you build lesson plans that will help to bridge those gaps between the community needs and, and the, the experience that students on campus are having? How do you um, create more continuity there and help to bridge that gap? Um, for younger students. I would just quickly say to that, I actually teach my students how to, that's part of the course is how to create a program plan or a lesson plan, which have lots of similarities. So we actually do that process in the class um, and then take those lessons out, so. Um, since we do it for elementary school students, um, 
we focus on that age range. But I think it's applicable for high school as well as what we do is um, I'll guide the students a little bit during the class on how to do this, but the focus is um, on what the MCPS needs and what fits into their curriculum. Um, they don't want curriculum that they can't use effectively to meet their goals. Um, now, I have goals that don't necessarily always match up with their goals. Um, so it's interesting to try to, ha try to meld those into one thing that I can feel good about um, presenting these students with. But um, it's really about meeting their curriculum needs is what I've noticed. Um, and you can get all that kind of stuff um, from the public school system that you're working with. And uh, when we developed this program, I wasn't involved at that point, but the girl, the graduate student that did develop this program worked closely with the public schools and a number of teachers to develop um, a curriculum that they felt would um, not only be effective, but also suit their needs. They want, from what I've noticed, teachers want um, things that fit in at their time. Um, so when they come up, I always ask them, what are you focusing on right now in class? And we'll guide our curriculum and develop our lesson plans for what they're usually focusing on during the time of year that they're going to come visit us. No? Okay. Um, I'm Marianne McKenna with the Department of Curriculum Instruction. Annie and I are colleagues. Um, and one of the things I think we can do to address your issue is partner with the School of Education and um, our teachers who are learning to do those, use those skills. Um, so we might have just birthed a service learning project. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question about how y you would prepare the agency to be a good context in which all of these projects can happen. Each one of you individually works for the agency, is obviously well prepared and organized and has the right personality and concern and engagement, but sometimes there's a, there's a mismatch outside of the one contact person and so I'd be interested in how you go about training the agency to have this influx of uh, other people uh, with other goals. Uh, to make the overall match effective. Is that, does that apply to any of you? I've seen this come up before. I can give kind of a sideways answer to this. Mm -hmm. uh, any, mo most of the agencies that are involved here are nonprofits. And as you all know, nonprofits are mission driven organizations. And as if you were writing a, a grant, you want to make sure that there's a great match. The match here means what you in, intend to do matches with the mission of the organization you're hoping to partner with. So it involves a little bit of, of homework, I think. So in our partnership, environmental studies partnership with Garden City Harvest, we can say, well, well, let's look hard at their mission. The second part of their mission statement says education and sustainable agriculture. So we go, oh, here's a good match. So organizationally, they should be somewhat set up for this. Now, Practically, they might not be receptive to dealing with an influx of people and all the personalities, et cetera. But I think the first step is to look at the mission statement of a potential organization. And if there isn't a match, I think it might be a good one to say no to even before you start. And I just wanted to add something with the flagship program that we've um, that we're working on currently is more training opportunities for the students that come to our organization. That we found that they might need more training and help with behavior management, human development, working with kids in low-income families. So we're actually piloting some projects this spring to give those students opportunity and all of our volunteers some more skills in working with those youth and some more support. So um, I think that's something that we've learned, that the more that we can support the students, um, that the more successful the partnership it is. So just realizing the students' needs as well. Well, to echo the earlier comment, I think I'm fortunate in that Missoula Aging Services, I think, also has a, a goal of uh, intergenerational activities, or at least I know when we started this project, that was a nice fit, and, and they were very interested in this, and presumably that still uh, is working for them. Um, 
but I, it does kind of lead me into another issue, and that is something that I think is often, um, I think the faculty involved know very well, but perhaps the administrators um, in the departments in which this is occurring may not be quite as aware of, and that is the need for support for faculty that are doing this. Uh, when I first started this project, Missoula Aging Services um, was, you know, I mean, they're very interested, they still are, but they were also able to commit some actual staff time to help get it on its feet. Uh, but after that first year, the person in charge of, of this particular area told me, you know, we just can't do that any longer. You're going to have to take all of that over. And they just send me the list now of the seniors, and, and we take it from there. Um, if I didn't have an assistant, which I am lucky to do uh, because of other work that I do in my department, I don't think I'd be able to do this because the amount of uh, contacting, communicating, just all the arrangements and things that have to be made are really outside the realm of most faculty's time to spend on this. And I think that's an unrecognized need that uh, needs to be recognized if faculty are going to be encouraged and um, uh, expected, perhaps not expected, but at least encouraged to do this kind of teaching. And I would just like to respond to Gail and say how much we appreciate all of the work that goes into this because it is a lot of work and I think it's important to really look at your team or your organization and figure out are you ready to do it? Are you ready to do it first? And maybe you're not and maybe you need to bring in a volunteer to do it or to get it started because I know in the social service field in the academic world we're wearing 12 different hats sometimes, volunteer coordinators, curriculum writers, we got our hands in the dirt, we're doing so many different things. So, And if you can't manage it well, find someone that can or create a position for it. I'll take a crack at it. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, um, Lisa, you mentioned the Service Learning Faculty Awards, and I wonder if you or perhaps Andrea could say a little more about that uh, for the benefit of the faculty in the room. And I don't know how many years ago this began. Maybe seven? Ten. Ten years? Ten years ago. Um, we went through the Office of Civic Engagement to recruit volunteers for the flagship program. And um, we averaged probably, I'd say, about eight, 800 students at the university. And um, it came upon us through the Office of Civic Engagement uh, that we needed some money to support some of these projects. So we formalized service learning with the flagship program. And then, um, we had an opportunity, and I'm not sure exactly where the opportunity arose, but um, George Dennison allocated um, $5,000 to the flagship program for service learning projects through the Office of Civic Engagement. And now it's grown to $12,000 because we've been so successful. But this is something that we, um, we follow through every year and write a letter and write reports about how well it's going, and the need is there the need is great. So um, it's the support of the university and George Dennison to make that happen. Yeah, these grants are available to UM faculty in partnership with the various flagship schools. Um, the grant sizes range anywhere from probably as low as 800 upwards of $2,000 for a semester or for a year-long project. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's funding allocated by President Dennison to support service learning with flagship. Mm -hmm. um, and those are usually uh, the timeline for that, if you're interested in looking at applying, is uh, early in the fall is mm -hmm. when Lisa's working with the faculty on campus to um, help, you, help connect need with opportunity. Well, and, and even now, I mean, I'm having conversations with people now for next year and uh, finding support for some of our programs in the schools. So, because we, we do extensive um, surveying at our schools about what some of the gaps and needs are, and then with that, we come to the university and try to match those with some professors like Annie Sondag and make it happen, so. 
And through our office, too, we do provide resources for faculty who are interested in developing this component of their teaching. Um, so as they've all stated, it is work, it's, it's extra work, and it's um, sometimes very hard work, but it's also very, very rewarding work, and it can transform the way you teach and the way that students learn. So our office is available on campus to come in and work with you individually. There's a lot of different resources, both literature and on the web, that um, we can point you in the right direction. So with that, I want to formally thank our panelists for their wonderful insights and experiences that they've shared. Thank you.